Hey everybody, welcome in on this Friday, October 8th. Hope everyone is doing well. Welcome into Morning Invest. It does sound like, uh, we're, uh, Phillip's in today uh, in the control booth uh, running the show. Um, it does sound like this is sort of like like a Chinese or, or maybe, yeah, I don't know, what would you just like a, yeah, sort of a peaceful. Bit. It's, kind of, it's nice. It's a, it's a little like early. I'm in a, like I'm in a, like in a Japanese tea garden or something. <laughs> It's it's That's early funny. it's early in the morning for me to be listening to such such uh, low key music. I'm like yeah, I'm trying to wake up and yeah, I don't want to blast people out with like rock and roll, you know, like so it's just it's just quiet in the background. But hey, good morning everybody. On today's show, it's payroll jobs day, payroll jobs day. Um, so this is perhaps the most important of the jobs data. You know, it's been like a week of jobs data and uh, economic data. Wednesday, we had the ADP numbers. Yesterday, of course, we had the Bureau and La of Labor Statistics numbers. Today, it's payroll jobs. Uh, and that means um, we we have to dive into some of these these numbers that just came out a few moments ago, just before the show started. So I'm going to go through this breaking news this morning for you and what this means uh, for the broader economy. And frankly, what does it mean for the Federal Reserve, which is planning this uh, tapering program, which could start, frankly, in, in November? Um, it, it may actually put the brakes on it. We'll tell you why uh, about that. We're also going to talk about the debt ceiling disaster. It's been averted for now. Congress kicking the can down the street, kicking it into December. You know, they, they can't solve the problem, so they'd rather just kick it down the street. We're going to hear a lot of uh, Republicans think that Mitch McConnell blinked on this issue. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz blasting Mitch McConnell yesterday. So some infighting among Republicans. We'll hear from Ted Cruz. We're also going to talk about Bernie Sanders, and he's had enough of Joe Manchin. He held a press conference yesterday and went after Joe Manchin, calling him basically a hypocrite. Uh, for the amount of money that West Virginia receives to help that struggling economy. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about this $3.5 trillion stimulus, which may be cut in half now, because Joe Manchin says, I'm not going to go anywhere near $3.5 trillion, and Joe Biden now saying he has a new number. So we'll tell you what that new number is this morning. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. Plus, we've got your pet photos today on the show. So at the end of the show, we will show your pet photos. Hopefully you sent them in already. Because the deadline was yesterday. You know, you got to get them in early, right? You can always email us, right, at pets at morninginvest.com. That's how you email them, too. You just send it via email. Put in your name and the name of the pet. Pets at morninginvest.com. We're a pet-friendly show around here. Grover, my co-host. Um, yeah, Fridays are my favorite day of the week because I love all those yeah. How many pets do you have, Philip, by the way? Uh, I have zero. Hmm. <laughs> I, I, am a, I am a dog person for sure. My daughter is a cat person, but... Uh, uh, we just we don't have one because our our current landlord like they don't allow them oh. and but they they do for like because my daughter had a recommendation to have uh an emotional support pet but they the people i rent from they made such a just a ordeal out of it it just wasn't worth it so that's ridiculous i mean i yeah. will say look you know in the in the re, in the real estate space think about this for a second if you're a landlord right it's always difficult for pet owners to find property to live in, right? And especially right now in this environment where it's just hard to find properties, right? So imagine if you're a landlord, you could charge more, have a pet deposit, a pet fee, and pet owners tend to then, once they find a place that's landlord friendly for pets, they tend to stay for many years because it's they know it's hard to go find another property, another apartment, because you might not find a pet friendly apartment. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing to me, plus like, most of the tenants here because it's a it's a five plex and like most of the tenants here have pets yeah but it was just yeah. like the the it's two brothers that i rent from and the one brother was was more he went he was the one i talked to when we were moving in and he said the the emotional support animal was fine and then the other brother was just like throwing such a fit about it and he was i, I don't know like basically like it came down to him trying to like uh, explain to me how I should be raising my daughter and I was like I'm gonna end up getting evicted if I <laughs> if I right. tell this guy what I think you tell me how I'm raising my daughter with a pet ridiculous yeah yeah uh yeah so we are a pet friendly show uh I was I attempted to bring in a video that it, uh, this morning see if I could do it see if I can do it right now but I I took uh, Grover to the beach again this morning and he um uh he, he, I don't know for whatever reason like he he's not good at fetch um, he will take the ball like I we, we found a rubber ball on the beach and uh, and I'm keeping it um, because, you know, tennis balls don't really work. So but he just does not understand the concept of of fetch like he 
you know, I, I, he won't let me get the ball. Like that's a problem, <laughs> right? Like I need that ball in order to throw it, but you want me to throw it. So I come to get it and then you want to fight me over it. He's like, okay, you're going to let me do it. And then he grabs my arm. He's like, no, 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 I want that. I'm like, okay, now here, go <laughs> fetch it. Go fetch it. There you go. Now that's how we do it. And then he, he kind of brings me. No, then he brings it back and then he just like runs right past me. So he doesn't, he doesn't know what he wants to do. No, no. I mean, can't you should just, you should just carry a whole basket of balls. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I should do. All right, everybody. Hey, it is Friday. It is uh, October 8th. We've got a lot of news to get to today. We're going to talk about the stimulus, why it's likely to be cut in half. Thanks to Joe Manchin. We'll talk about those numbers. um, And we will also talk about the latest on the debt ceiling. Uh, We'll talk about all of that and more as uh, Morning Invest kicks into high gear on this Friday. You guys ready to get uncomfortable? We We have a lot to get uncomfortable about this morning. Morning Invest starts right now. And good morning, everybody. Welcome in. If you're new here, please uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit that subscribe button. We do this show every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. We take the weekends off because, you know, I've got three kids and I need to see them. Uh, hey, by the way, next week, big, big announcement, big changes coming to, uh, to Morning Invest. So make sure you're subscribed. Follow along in our community tab because I'm going to be posting some interesting photos this weekend. A little teaser for you. Posting some photos, okay? And I'll maybe post some behind the scenes videos of what's going on this weekend. But I'm excited about it. I'm really excited about it. Um, but some big, big, big changes. I'm excited about it too. I think it's I think it's gonna be a, a, a knock this one out of the park. Yeah, I, I well thank you. I, I'm I'm uh, yeah, I'm very, very excited. And I'm not just saying that. Uh, I really, really am excited about what we have coming on Monday. And so I will say just bear with us as we go through some growing pains. Um, well, hey, many of you have been here for over a year with us on the show every morning. And so thank you so much for that. Um, and so we've definitely grown and changed. And But this there's going to be a big, big change coming on Monday. And I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to take the show to a whole new level. And I couldn't be more thrilled about it. So anyway, that's coming on Monday. Be sure you're subscribed. Uh, and turn on the little bell notification so you'll be notified about that. Good morning, everybody in the chat. Good to see everybody from Michelle to Frederick, Derek, Dean, Letta, James, Kristen Swenson, Jason, Frank. Kristen, do you like that I say your last name? I just like how it sounds. Wendy King, the, Lita Westcott. Lots of people are asking where David is. Uh, David has a, a court appearance today. Uh, oh, so yeah, yeah. He's going to deal with that crap. That would, it would interrupt the show. So rather than getting half David, half me, we just went with all me. We went, we went with 100% Philip instead of half Philip, half David, which when you right. combine that, you basically get uh, Phil a David. Phil a right. Or, or just zeroes out. We just cancel each other out and nothing <laughs> right. happens. Like when both teams have a penalty, it just zeroes it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, let's start with the, uh, well, we're going to get to the debt in just a second, but let's start with the jobs data because I think it's in many ways, it's all kind of tied together here. So uh, jobs data out just moments ago, the September report, uh, not good, <laughs> not good, um, badly misses the expectations. Uh, Payroll is only increasing by 194,000. Um, the unemployment rate falls to 4.8% from 5.2%. Um, it's weird though. I mean, they've added a 20, 26,000 manufacturing jobs, also wages up more than expected. Um, but basically, uh, if we look at the report, you can see here, it's just, it's not on a good trend right now. Um, it's on a downward trend. Okay. So August also revised numbers down as well. So 194,000 into September. And you would think Right. You would think that we would have the like these seasonally adjusted numbers like, you know, uh, 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 from from people having the summer jobs. Not the case. Not good. Um, The headline number was the hundred and twenty three thousand decline in government payrolls as well. Uh, Private payrolls increased by three hundred and seventeen thousand. Drop in jobless rate came as uh, the labor force participation rate also edged lower meaning just fewer people taking to the market, which is interesting because we've had the unemployment um, insurance and benefits, the federal unemployment benefits also pulled back and dried up. So you would think that, like if this argument from Republicans would hold up, this idea, right, that the, uh, you know, that, hey, we've got all these people are not receiving those unemployment benefits anymore. They're going to head back to that crappy job that they left because they're, you know, they were treated poorly there. They're going to just, they're just going to go back. 
didn't happen. Didn't happen. Um, but we did see, and maybe this is a positive sign, a slight wage increase in some areas. So we're seeing some wage increase. That's good news. Uh, but boy, uh, this is not this is not be, where I'd, we need it to be. I'd be interested in seeing some side by side numbers of as wages increase if the jobs numbers go up. Wouldn't that be interesting? It'd almost be like if you pay people more, more people will want to work for you. Imagine that. And we already know that that's the case. Like imagine, you know, imagine that these jobs, the, you know, the, the wages go up, you get benefits, you're, you're treated better. You know, are you more likely to stay at that job or return to that job or even take that job? I mean, businesses are now having to get creative, uh, you know, for, for to attract new employees. I think um, that's funny that they, they, they consider it businesses being creative when it's right. really just like, <laughs> you know, like, like that, what a, what a, a novel idea that is. What if we took care of our employees? I wonder if yeah. people would want to work here and stay longer. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be amazing if like workers, That's like instead, you know, they're out there striking right now, like the Kellogg's workers, the Frito-Lay workers, and, you know, they're saying, hey, I'm tired of working 80 hours a week. You know, I'm tired of, uh, I'm tired of not having any days off. We told you about the Kellogg's workers, right, yesterday on the show. I mean, so all of these different Kellogg's plants shut down said, you know what, we're tired of not having any days off. They Literally, a lot of these Kellogg's workers don't have any days off until the end of the year or through the whole rest of the year. No days off. How do you not have a day off? Like, is cereal and Cheez-Its that important? You know, it's funny because I, I worked at Amazon for over a year uh, uh, as a uh, AFM, which is like on the robotics floor. Yeah. And even even during their peak time, like, you couldn't take scheduled uh, holiday stuff like during certain periods, but you, your your paid time off and your unpaid time off, you could take it whenever. And so it still didn't matter if it was during peak. So they were a little bit better about that, but it was, uh, yeah. you know, and then they won't let you organize and unionize at, at Amazon. So that's what, you know, you're seeing, in, you know, you're seeing Canada right now. Uh, Amazon employees are just starting to form a union there. Like they can do it in Canada. Can't do it here, though. So job gains were spread across a variety of other sectors. Transportation, warehousing, 47,000. Information, social assistance, about 32,000, 30,000, respectfully. Manufacturing, 26,000. Construction, 22,000. By the way, construction. We still need two. We're, we're, we have a deficit of construction jobs. You know, if you want to learn a trade right now, anything from electrical work to plumbing to construction... There is a need for 200,000, 200,000 construction jobs in the United States. And we, that's how many we need right now. We don't have them. So we only added about two, uh, 22,000 construction jobs. Huge deficit of construction jobs. And they're paying very, very well. So if that's a trade you're thinking about going into or learning or studying electric, you know, electricity, plumbing, etc. I have a friend whose son had started, he just out of college, he started his electricity company. His electricity firm, small little, little you know, electricity, that's the word I'm looking for, company, I guess, yeah. Um, and uh, where they go out and help people, you know, do different electrical jobs. He's just doing gangbusters, you know, just doing gangbusters. So yeah, trades or something. I always push trades on anybody that'll listen. Because, I mean, I did that for, for I was a, a journeyman finished carpenter for a little over a decade oh, yeah? when I was younger. Yeah. And uh, you always I, I always, I always, yeah. And I always push it because it's like, it's like if you imagine going to college, you, you walk out of there with like a debt of fifty to $75,000. In trades, it takes just as long to hit that journeyman level, which is basically the equivalent of having a degree. And you get paid the entire time you're there. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it's not like there are no, there are no free internships or unpaid internships and stuff like that. I mean, it's like, I think, I think I started, uh, when I started in carpentry, I think I was making 16 an hour. Uh, and that was in like the early 2000s. And like starting out at sixteen dollars an hour to learn a trade. Wow. Yeah, like right now, like down in hurricane area, you know, where they had all the hurricane damage, like, you know, they can't even find contractors. I mean, that you know, they're just people waiting to try to fix their homes after Hurricane Ida. You know, trying to get, you know, just simple jobs done, a roof repair or things like that. Uh, they just can't find them. Kristen in our chat just says she knows uh Construction companies that just can't find materials. Also, that's another thing, you know. Then the supply, supply and demand. Right now, we can't pay an eleven dollars for a two by four. Right now, we had a story in the newsletter this morning about um, about haunted houses. I don't know if you saw that in the newsletter this morning, but uh, haunted houses are, are like 
they, they, they just can't afford the materials. So all these like haunted houses for Halloween all around the United States that they would normally put up like, you know, plywood and two by fours and do the whole thing in the woods and whatever. They can't afford it because it's $11 instead of a $2 two by four. It's 11 bucks for a two by four. It's crazy. That's just insane. Yeah. Because I know, I know how many two by fours go into construction and that's, that's pricey. Yeah. That's ridiculous. So overall, the report comes at a really critical time right now, these jobs numbers for the economy. The recent data shows that solid consumer spending despite rising prices. So we're seeing that consumers are still spending money, but the jobs aren't there. The job growth isn't there. So consumer confidence, it's really weird, right? I mean, consumer confidence is up. Even though the numbers for the inflation numbers are going up and people are paying twice, you know, they're paying way more for things. Consumer confidence is, is fine. It's off the actually, according to data this morning that I was looking at, it's some of the best consumer numbers we've seen ever, which is kind of boggles the mind. Like, I'm afraid something is missing in all of this. Like, what is missing? Like, I challenge you to think about this at home right now. Like, what, you know, why are people not? taking these jobs okay the jobs that are available is it because they're crappy and they're just they're they're treated poorly and they they just don't want that job and they've started a, their own business at home or there's something else they're doing remember the unemployment benefits have dried up they're gone now right the, and so they're not getting like this extra government money which is what we kept hearing from republicans is that oh, you're just lazy you're just lazy and you're taking this money and you're not going back to work well that is all gone and they're still not taking these crappy jobs. So what's going on here? And consumer confidence is way up. And these consumer numbers are, are really high. Uh, it's just really bizarre. And then if we have these inflation numbers that are kind of at that 2% area right now, that should also be affecting these this overall jobs and payroll and consumer confidence picture. So... I mean, officials are saying, hey, these jobs market is still well short of the full employment. Um, and look, once we do have a full employment, then that's when we could see interest rate hikes. So I don't know. This is a weird disjointed moment. It'll be interesting to watch the Fed over the next uh, few months to see if they begin to taper these bond purchasing and pull back on that, stop funneling all this money to Wall Street. And or will they say, wait a second, we're going to push this into 2022, maybe 2023. We're going to sit on this because clearly the economy is not where it needs to be right now. So. Let me know in the chat what you guys think about this. These are the latest on the jobs numbers. Um, and we'll get to, uh, let's, uh, we'll talk about kicking the debt can in a moment. And we've got to the stimulus, which we'll get to in a moment. But I want to tell you about a great podcast. If you haven't checked this out, um, the Modern Finance Podcast. Um, it's an investment world. It's changed tremendously. Bitcoin, NFTs, robo-investors are all the tips of everyone's tongues. But how do you know if any of it's right for you? Modern Finance is a podcast that helps demystify crypto, decentralized finance, and more. Um, it's listed as one of the top, twi uh, one of the hosts of the show, Kevin Rose, listed one of the top 25 angel investors by Bloomberg and one of the top five, 20, 25 most influential people on the web, one of the hosts of the show. Modern Finance is the crypto show for the novice and the expert alike. Their mission is to demystify crypto in the world of NFTs. So you got to go over and check them out. Feel informed about your investments. You know, don't let your crypto guy friend be the life of the party. By listening to Modern Finance, you'll feel well equipped to discuss and understand the world of crypto, NFTs, and the future of finance. You know, get your money out of the U.S. dollar. Go to the financial landscape. The financial landscape is harder than ever to navigate, but you don't have to do it alone. Download and subscribe to Modern Finance wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Amazon Music, all of it. That's Modern Finance wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't be the last person on the next train out. Listen to Modern Finance and get ahead on the future of finance. All right, let's talk about some finance this morning. Let's talk about the debt ceiling and the stimulus. So some pretty big news overnight. The United States government will not be shutting down this month. We will not be defaulting on our debts this month. The Senate voted to increase the borrowing limit in order to keep the country going at least through December. So again, we, we, can't, we, can't, make a, we can't solve this problem, but we can at least get this done uh, through through December. Uh, this song and dance will, of course, resume just after Thanksgiving. Uh, the markets this morning are up on this news because they have just like, they're like Dor, um, what's, is it Dory in, uh, in, in, uh, um, 
Finding Little Nemo. Nemo. Finding yeah, yeah. Nemo. Dory. Where yep. Dory has like short-term memory loss, you know. And, and that's like Wall Street. Wall Street, hey, that that's fine. That's totally fine. But you give us another three months to just make a whole gallon of money, we'll be totally fine. That's Wall Street. So the final agreement will increase the borrowing limit by $480 billion to fund the country through December 3rd. And then the Senate approved this on Thursday, and then the House of Representatives will hold its vote on October 12th, and the measure is expected to pass. So we will avert this October 18th debt limit deadline that where the government would totally collapse and we would default on all of our debts. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen hinted that the debt ceiling should be abolished altogether, a notion which is both practical and somewhat terrifying, right? Instead of having these debates over and over and over again, maybe we just get rid of it altogether. But then that just means that there's... Uh, well, the, for, here's the thing. They've never failed to raise it, right? So now it would just be unlimited and there would be no debate about it. But let me know in the chat. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that we should that there should be a debt limit and we'd have to negotiate this regularly or just like get rid of this thing so we can have it run as deeply as we want. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm going to, I'm going to contact my credit card company and see if I can get a credit card with that deal. Just, I just don't want, I just don't want a limit. <laughs> I just don't want a limit. Oh, and by the way, I don't want to pay it back. Yeah. I, I want the, I want the option to whenever I want to, to not pay it back. You know what yeah. I mean? I think, I think, I mean, it's kind of obvious how they, they like kicking this down the road because they want to punt it closer to election time. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they took care of it now and everything was fine, there'd be too long between now and and elections for it to be relevant. People would forget about it and then they can't bring it up as as a weapon that somehow works both ways. <laughs> you a lot know, of, it's like, yeah, a lot of people in our chat saying like Belinda, uh, Belinda Edwards saying abolish it, get rid of it. Uh, Katie will go says fire them all. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, get rid of the debt ceiling. Richard Blackstone says, uh, Teresa says the sky is the ceiling. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Derek Ead says, I never understand why Congress has to raise the limit every year. It's ridiculous. Uh, Tyler says, yeah, get rid of it. No, we shouldn't We shouldn't have a debt limit, Tyler. Um, James says, yeah, get rid of the limit so we can end the bickering. And Kristen says, if we just abolish Congress, we can fix our debt problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. So this is a temporary measure. It's going to allow Republicans to point out that the country's budget is already strained in order to oppose President uh, Biden's $3.5 trillion infrastructure plan. It's going to be a hard sell while another government shutdown looms. But Democrats are still going to try. They're still going to try to push this through right now. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to see this back and forth. Senator Ted Cruz basically blaming Mitch McConnell yesterday on the Senate floor. It was really interesting to watch this. Um, he said, you know, Mitch McConnell, you blinked, you know, both parties are to blame here. And uh, Republicans are, you know, should be ashamed of themselves for supporting this debt limit increase because he pointed his finger at Mitch McConnell specifically. With a pandemic unlike anything any of us have ever seen in our lives. I wish Republicans had been better at exercising fiscal responsibility. <laughs> I wish. Good. Good. Yeah. How about an $8 trillion debt that you, under President Trump, ran up, right? And then you want to become sanctimonious and tell other people that, they, you know, you can't believe that there's gambling going on in this establishment. Wow, you really going to spend this kind of money after you guys literally spent $8 trillion? Eight trillion, and you get to then lecture us about spending. When we had control of the White House and both houses of Congress, the unfortunate reality in this body, though, is that when you have a multi-trillion-dollar spending bill, you can usually count on the votes of every single Democrat and about half the Republicans. And so on spending bill after spending bill, we see 75 to 80 senators coming together, usually all the Democrats and half the Republicans. And there are about 20 of us who try to say, why are we bankrupting our kids and grandkids? Why are we digging the hole deeper and deeper and deeper? You're such a good person, you know, Ted. I, I am moved. I am Ted, you, you, you really like when I look at when I open up uh, when I open up the dictionary to good person, like there's a picture of him. 
weasel snake oil salesman Ted Cruz, who abandons his state, goes on vacation to Cancun while his, uh, his own constituents are freezing, and then blames it on his kids. Sanctimonious. There's only 20 of us who are such good people that we, we say, why are we spending so much money? But I did vote for a you know military increase budget, so I, I you know I like to get up here and I like to pound my chest and pretend that I'm you know I'm better than other people. Meanwhile, when you're not looking, I'm approving all sorts of big money during the PPP loan program to make sure that all the big oil companies and so forth of Texas were getting bailouts and all kinds of money and no interest loans and everything else. I'm like I'm such a good person. Call me Ted. We're friends, right? Weasel. After Senator Joe Manchin then tried to draw a distinction between himself and Senator Bernie Sanders yesterday, this was a whole battle yesterday. So uh, really an unbelievable as it relates to not only the debt limit, uh, now we're having the battle. So the debt limit, you can t it's all tied together into this stimulus package. But now the stimulus package really is on, on you know, in the middle of the frying pan right now. So the $3.5 trillion stimulus package that is supposed to be, you know, the the the, the real uh, feather in the cap of, of President Biden. Like this is going to be his main legacy and agenda is the, you know, $3.5 trillion stimulus package that's going to radically alter uh, the American landscape. And I think it absolutely could based on some of the, you know, the framework that we've seen on climate change, on elder care, on uh, child care, on families, um, on health care, on Medicare, on prescription drugs, you know, on prescription drugs. I mean, the list is long. But Senator Joe Manchin thinks we just cannot spend this kind of money. You know, at some point, we've got to put our foot down. You know, we've got to just say we can't spend this money. He's okay, literally approving. Mitch McConnell, uh, sorry, uh, Joe Manchin has approved over $9 trillion in spending for the military. That's been his track record. He's okay with that. $9 trillion. He's totally fine with that. But now, when it comes to helping the people of West Virginia and otherwise, he, he just can't stomach it. So, you know, Joe Manchin yesterday drew a distinction and opened himself up pretty good. He said, you know, about Bernie Sanders... You know, what Bernie Sanders wants is an entitlement society that you guys are all just entitlement, you know, junkies. You know, you want your entitlement. You want your cheaper prescription drugs and you want your health care. You're just entitled. Like everyone watching right now in my chat right now on this live show, you guys are all just entitled. You're lazy, entitled Americans, according to Joe Manchin. Wanting right? things like health and education, like entitled. Yeah, entitled. yeah, Philip. Like you want, you want education. You're an entitled <laughs> son of a gun. Like you want to learn. Like a government's That's sole job is to protect its people, right? To take care of its people. That's it. Healthcare. I mean, it's just like it's education. just like such a. Oh, sorry. It's just like it's such a, a, a like a peon argument, like. Like, how dare you want to better yourself? Like, that's not what right. you're supposed to do. How dare Just you? Peasant. <laughs> yeah, unless you're like a big oil or gas company or coal company, you know, then I'll then I'll make sure you got all the handouts you need, right? I'll take care of you here in West Virginia, Joe Manchin. I'll take care of you. But when it comes to helping the American people, you're just entitled, lazy sons of guns, you know? And so the difference, I love this. He says, what Bernie Sanders wants is an entitlement society. And then Joe Manchin stands up and he says, you know what I want? I want a compassionate and rewarding society. <laughs> so Bernie Sanders had quite the rejoinder last night. Watch him clap back at Joe Manchin last night on MSNBC. Watch this, if you can stomach the MSNBC. I was after you gave your, your press conference today and talked about Senator Manchin by name in such um, specific terms. Um, he put out a statement 
um, saying that you and he have very different uh, political beliefs and that he thinks that you want America to be an entitlement society where he doesn't want that. He wants what he called a compassionate and rewarding society. Uh, it's an unusual dynamic playing out sort of a, a, effectively through the press um, with you at this press conference and him in this written statement today. Are the two of you going to eventually get together face to face and talk this out personally? Well, we Will that we, uh... part of be the way this resolves? Well, it's not just me. We do meet. He's part of leadership. I'm part of the Democratic leadership. Every week we sit down, and, and these issues do coming up. Uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, and, and we need Mr. Manchin, Senator Manchin, to help us out here, what a compassionate and rewarding society is it, about. Does that mean uh, addressing the reality that 600,000 people in America uh, are homeless? Uh, does it mean dealing with the grotesque level of income and wealth inequality? that we have this, it mean, you know, uh, dealing with the fact that one out of four Americans can't fill the prescriptions that their doctors write because the price of drugs in this country is in some cases 10 times higher than it is in Canada and other countries. So we need some specificity. Now, you know, if he wants to say, I believe in an entitlement society, I would not look at it, use that phraseology. I do believe in a nation based on economic, social, racial, and environmental justice, yeah. Frankly, I admit it. You got it right here on your show. I believe that all <laughs> Americans are entitled as human beings to health care. I believe people are entitled to quality education regardless of their income. I believe that people are entitled to affordable housing. I don't believe that two people are entitled to own more wealth than the bottom 40 percent of American society. And by the way, one of the things that's playing out here, Rachel, I don't think the media has paid a appropriate attention to it, is in the midst of all of this, the ruling class of this country, and that is the drug companies, the insurance companies, fossil fuel industry, they're spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Pharmaceutical industry has 1,500 paid lobbyists on Capitol Hill, three lobbyists for every member of Congress so that we don't raise prescription drugs. So this is a pivotal moment in American history, it seems to me, really. And I'm going to continue to fight as I have for working families and do my best to prevent this country from moving in an authoritarian direction because you've got so many people out there. They're working long routes for lower wages. Their kids are going nowhere in a hurry. They can't take care of their parents. And they are saying, does the United States government care about me or are they only worried about their campaign contributions from wealthy individuals? So this is not only trying to improve life for working families who are really struggling to keep ends, their ends together. It is whether or not we retain a democracy in which government works for all and not just the very wealthy and the powerful. Yeah, that's a pipe dream. When has this government really worked for the people? I mean, really? You know, that's what we'd like, but that doesn't exist right now. So keep fighting, Bernie. West Virginia, by by. Just so you understand, Joe Manchin's territory. West Virginia is the fourth largest recipient of federal money. But okay, Joe. As opposed to the compassionate and rewarding society Manchin says he wants. So I guess West Virginia then is entitled? Because they get the fourth largest recipient of federal money? And Joe Manchin now says he will not support the $3.5 trillion stimulus package. We've known about that. He said yesterday he's he he will only go as high as 1.5 trillion. 1.5 trillion. That's where he'll go. 1.5 trillion is the highest that he'll go. So, you know, I mean, when I say cut in half, I mean frankly more than half. You know, 3.5 trillion down to 1.5 trillion, that you know, you're you're looking at way less money for all of these programs. Prescription drugs being uh, lowered, the cost of prescription drugs, probably not. No, I mean, because you, know? you, you know they're not going to, when they start cutting things to hit this 1.5 trillion number, you know it's not going to be oil companies, the coal companies. You know, it's like, that's not who they're going to cut. They're going to cut the stuff that they feel like is fluff, like education or, you know, like like prescription drugs, you know, like things that people don't really need. This is the, the kind of, oh, that's well, just already, padding in the bill. Yeah, I mean, well, we've already seen him try to shoehorn in like, hey, if we're going to do an electrical a power upgrade in this country for electric vehicles, we also need to make sure that we also give incentives for the fossil fuel trucks. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, like no, the no, buses. No. Uh, we, the we buses. Need, we need more, we need more like 
fossil fuel buses if we're going to have electric ones. Yeah, so if you're going to add electric buses, the whole point is to reduce our carbon footprint. Okay, if you're going to add electric buses, we also want to have... So if you're going to add 50 new electric buses per city, we also want you to add 50 new fossil fuel buses. Okay? Okay? That's how I make my deals here in West Virginia. That's I'm Joe Manchin. What? No, you completely are missing the point. <laughs> like, you're not getting it, are you, Joe? And, and, I mean, and, 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 and Kirsten Cinema. And if they don't want that, then they at least need to burn barrels of oil just in an open field next to a tire fire. Just <laughs> yeah, you so need to have, offsets the... <laughs> you need to have a burn pit. You just yeah. need to, you know... Yeah, if you can't do that, you just need to open up a burn pit so we have, like, our skies are filled with black smoke. Uh, but this is sad. I mean, this is what we're seeing right now is this, you know, any kind of a stimulus. And so yesterday, President Biden came out and said, okay, okay, okay. I'm willing to go down to as low as $2 trillion. That's not enough for Manchin. So Manchin and Cinema, these two people, these two senators are literally holding this entire thing hostage. They've now managed to eliminate $1.5 trillion off of the overall stimulus package. Think about getting stimulus checks. Good luck with that. At least that could have been in this larger package. Who knows if it'll make it in there. But he says, oh, I won't even go high as, as high as $2 trillion. So mark my words, we're going to end up seeing a stimulus package come out of the Biden administration that's going to be somewhere around like 1.7, maybe 1.6. That's going to be it. How many things will now get cut? Prescription drugs? What about expanding the child tax credit? right? For families. What about the non-child tax credit for people who are single, who don't have children? That's in there. Will that be eliminated? Like what's going to get cut now, Joe? This is all, you know, and so Bernie Sanders held a press conference after this yesterday and had a few choice words for, uh, for Senator, uh, Senator Manchin. Comments uh, about what Senator Manchin uh, said earlier today. Uh, first, let us be clear. Uh, poll after poll, including polls in West Virginia, show that what we are trying to do in this reconciliation bill is enormously popular among the American people. But it's not just the American people who support what we're trying to do. 48 out of 50 members of the Senate Democratic Caucus support the bill, and 210 members, about 96 percent of the House Democratic Caucus support the bill. And by the way, the President of the United States uh, supports the bill. Uh, and while we're at it, uh, let me tell you who is vigorously opposed to this legislation. And I think it's important that the American people understand that. Because this is the corruption of American politics. Basically, he's calling Joe Manchin corrupt. Right there. This is the corruption of American politics. This is leveled right at Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, taking money from fossil fuel companies and and and, uh, and and hedge funds and other Wall Street big shots that don't want their taxes to go up, that that don't want to have to reduce the amount of money that they make from from selling prescription drugs. Corruption. The pharmaceutical industry is currently spending hundreds of millions of dollars on lobbying on campaign contributions, on advertising to oppose this bill because they do not want to have us lower the outrageously high cost of prescription drugs in America. The health insurance industry is spending a huge amount of money because they do not want us to expand Medicare to cover dental, hearing aids, and eyeglasses. The fossil fuel industry, the coal companies and the... Oh, the coal companies. Who are you talking about here? Joe Manchin? Oil companies are spending millions of dollars despite the fact that the scientists are virtually unanimous in telling us that we must end our dependence on fossil fuel and move to energy efficiency and sustainable energy if we are going to save this planet. And it goes without saying that the billionaire class and the large corporations are spending a fortune in opposition to this bill because they love the idea that some of the wealthiest people in this country and the largest corporations in a given year 
do not pay a nickel in federal income tax. And they're fighting to preserve that absurdity. Corrupt. Joe Manchin, corrupt. Corrupt politician, Kirsten Cinema, corrupt. Taking all this money from fossil fuel companies, demanding that we lower the overall cost of this spending bill, and yet he's given nine, he's approved nine trillion dollars in spending for the United States military budgets. He makes sure that, you know, all kinds of incentives go out for these big, uh, big pharmaceutical companies, fossil fuel companies, coal companies, etc. No wonder, no wonder we can't get anything done. Uh, and the people get screwed once again. So we'll keep our eye on it. We'll see if Joe Biden is going to stand up and use the power of the presidency to say, I am not budging off of my $3.5 trillion. But yesterday he came out and said, I'm willing to go down to 2 I'm willing to take a $1.5 trillion off my number. Because Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema want a lower number. That's your stimulus update. Let's talk about, uh, I want to talk now about the trust in the media. Maybe this is all tied together. Uh, we've got some new trust in the media numbers out this morning, which are really pretty amazing. Uh, not surprising that trust in the media has dipped to its second lowest uh, point on record in recent, in recent memory. Uh, not surprising at all. America's trust in the media continues to plummet, according to this new Gallup poll. This is the second lowest confidence number on record for the mainstream media. So Gallup asked voters how much they trust the media, and only 7% reported to have a great deal of trust. 29% reported a fair amount of trust. By the way, what's a fair amount? <laughs> like, how do you, what is a fair amount? I love that. That Like, that's, that's a yeah, fair it's amount. Fair. <laughs> it's fair. Kind of yeah, that's uh, kind of. I don't know what fair is. I, I don't I don't know. Uh, results were split amongst party lines. People who voted for the Democratic Party were far more likely to trust the media. What does that say, by the way, about Democrats? Like that they're just drones? They're willing to flip on Stephen Colbert and, you know, they're willing to flip on the uh, MSNBC and CNN and, then, and believe that garbage? You know? And then it, more likely than those who have voted Republican, the, only 11% of Republicans reported having some trust in the media. 11% compared to 68% of Democrats had some trust in the media. That's a huge difference. When you think about like the media being the fourth house of, of government, you know, like they say, like that's the, mm -hmm. that's the fourth, fourth house. I mean, can you imagine if we had like 11% confidence in, <laughs> in government? I mean, that's ridiculous. Like if someone told you like, hey, Philip, you know, I have 11% confidence that you're going to get this job done. Are you going to do assume, a good job? Yeah, I'm going to assume that I'm, I'm in the wrong field and I'm going to move on. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I have 11% confidence that you're going to get this job done well. And, you know, okay, thanks. Thanks for your confidence there, Pops. It's the lowest score was reported during the presidential election between Trump and Hillary Clinton. Um, so this is, you know, it's not quite as low as it was back in 2016 here on your chart here at 32, but it is darn low. I mean, and no wonder, right? I mean, we, the American people flip on their local, you know, flip on their television stations and they flip on, you know, uh, they, they flip on these 24 hour news stations and they're filled with, they're filled with talking points, you know? They're filled with narratives of these billionaire corporations, right? At the end of the day, I think more and more people are waking up to the fact that all of these stations that they're watching on a regular basis, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, uh, Bloomberg, CNB, all of them, they're all run by billionaires, right? They're all run by billionaires. Why is this a surprise? So, you know, is that, is the jig up now? Like people understand that, hey, they're pushing a narrative. Like, why aren't we covering workers' strike stories on the mainstream media? Why aren't we covering uh, the story, like a story we're about to bring you in a moment here about Taiwan? Like, why is this being ignored? Why is what's really going on in these wars around the world not being covered? Instead, they're all, you know, pushing this narrative that we need to be in these endless wars and we've got to support the military industrial complex and support big pharmaceutical companies. So, we don't talk about the ridiculous cost of prescription drugs unless Bernie Sanders is talking about it. 
people don't trust the mainstream media anymore because they selectively edit, they block out, they they ignore stories. I mean, we I saw. Asked... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna say. I wonder. I wonder if they had asked that question, like, uh, of people's trust in billionaires. I bet it would look very, very similar. <laughs> Because that's yeah. basically what they asked. Well, it's to say, you know, it's weird that during this time, during the polling over the summer, people said that they had more of a trust in businesses than they did their government and the media, but not the CEOs. You know, it was more about the the businesses that people had more of a faith in, like big business, like the big business was going to swoop in and set Congress straight, tell them, you know, and by the way. These CEOs that were pissed about the debt ceiling, they called Mitch McConnell and yelled at him. And that's why he caved on this issue. At least temporarily. Yeah, because they don't they don't Congress doesn't need our money. They they get their money from business, from Wall Street. Right. It's not, it's not the people's money. We don't have any power in that. Between 1972 and 1976, 68 to 72 percent of Americans expressed tr expressed trust in the mass media. Think about that: 72 percent of Americans had trust in the media. I mean, this is a time when you have Watergate, you have you know uh, Woodward and Bernstein, you know you, you have the you know you have Walter Cronkite. You, you don't have these 24-hour news stations that are spinning yarns and pushing a narrative. So no wonder they don't trust the media, you know? Well, Not yeah, surprising you look at somebody at all. like Walter Cronkite, it wasn't like on, on his show, it wasn't like what he did was just sit there and give his opinion about whatever for an hour and then mm -hmm. leave. It was actually investigative journalism. It was actually like putting time and effort behind stories where now it just seems like so much of the media is just editorials. Right. And, that's and, all and investigative journalism was, I mean, we just don't have investigative journalism anymore. We have very little of it. We have very little of it. You know, I mean, we don't have people like Seymour Hirsch, Cy Hirsch, who was an incredible investigative journalist who uncovered all of the stuff that the CIA was doing in, in Vietnam. You know, and I mean, the only reason we, because we have investigative journalists, the only reason we knew this stuff, that they were like killing people in order to set up and pretend that it was the Viet Cong killing other people. And yet we were the ones doing it. Like, you know, the, the United States government was doing it. And we have, because of journalists, but they're just very few anymore. You know, very few anymore. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then, but we've got these ridiculous shows on CNN that pretend that they're like, they're, they're the arbiters of truth, you know, reliable sources. We're, we're your reliable source here at CNN to get to the bottom of how the media is handling these stories. <laughs> You're cracking me up. Yeah, exactly, Brian. Like that, that's our media situation right now. So again, I thank all of you for subscribing to this channel. We are independent. We are not run by billionaires. So if you're new here, you know, please subscribe to the channel. We cover stories you're not going to see covered other places, including, by the way, this next story. This story I find absolutely outrageous. I was going back and forth. Uh, I was texting a, a couple of journalist friends of mine this morning, highly respected journalist friends. Uh, I won't give names out, but um, and I, I just said, I cannot understand this story. How in the world do, is the United States, what the hell is going on in Taiwan where the United States has soldiers there? And by the way, it's been happening for over a year. It started under President Trump and no one knows about it. No talk about this story. My friend said, yeah, it's unbelievable. It's absurd. Like it is absolutely absurd. And we just go along with it. We don't even see it on the front page of newspapers. Oh, so the United States is sending troops to Taiwan to train troops in Taiwan. And yet the United States government isn't even going on the record about it. Like we had to find this out from l reports in Taiwan, like news stations in Taiwan that broke this story. Getting footage of United States troops training Taiwanese soldiers. By the way, I don't know if you know, but the United States doesn't have a very good track record of training troops. <laughs> like, I have you been we paying it? it? Yeah, we're the best at it, aren't we? We're the best at spending 20 years training your troops. Here's, here's our sales pitch. We'll spend 20 years training your troops. 
And then, and the moment when they need to 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 stand up to any anything, they'll run away. But it's not really about the training, is it? It's not about the training of these troops, right? This is, by the way, Pentagon spokesman who says our support for and defense relationships with Taiwan remains aligned against the current threat posed by the People's Republic of China. That's a Pentagon spokesperson. We urge Beijing to honor its commitment to the peaceful resolution of cross-strait differences. And then yesterday, we have a submarine, right? We have a submarine that suddenly, we reported this in the newsletter, suddenly hits a mysterious object in the water. And 11 soldiers are injured. In underwater in a U.S. submarine, a nuclear attack submarine in the South China Sea, hits a mysterious object? I'm telling you what, submarines do not just hit a random object that yeah, injures 11 like, people. And, like, I don't, I don't buy that, like, it's the whole mysterious object thing. They know what it was. Whatever it was, They know exactly what it was. Yeah. And what they'll say is, you know, I mean, who knows? I, you know, it's like, look... At some point, what's going to happen here is they're going to say, you know, that mysterious object, well, it was actually China. China did drop something. It was, a, it was a mine. They were trying to attack one of our submarines. And what we now go into, a, a you know, a, now we have this big war stance. We need to start funneling trillions of dollars into Taiwan now and into the South China Sea. We've already been ramping up our military in that region anyway. By the way, again, this started under Trump and we didn't know about it. This is all just kept quiet from us. Just go along. Don't, you know, you're not supposed to ask any questions. You're Americans. You shouldn't ask any questions. Our tr United States troops are sent to Taiwan. Here's the report. Here's the report. American forces have been quietly deployed to Taiwan with increasing regularity, a new report. The report that the U.S. military has been stepping up its activities in Taiwan for at least a year. Amid growing fears of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Right? So that's the thing. So we've got U.S. military now worried about a Chinese uh, invasion of Taiwan. New report from the Wall Street Journal says the contingents of the U.S. operations forces and U.S. Marines have been making more regular rotational deployments to Taiwan for at least a year. This news comes a day after uh, the island's defense minister, Shi Ku Cheng, said publicly that Chinese forces would be capable of launching a full-scale invasion operation across the Taiwan Strait with far fewer risks than they face now by 2025. Approximately 24 American special operators and other special uh, supporting forces are apparently on the island now, conducting training for units of Taiwan's ground forces. They're working with local maritime for forces on small boat training. And we've had this presence now for a year or more. Hmm. The presence of U.S. special operations forces hasn't been reported before. No mention of it. Okay, just shut up. Just go along with it. Don't ask questions. Arlene and Arlene in our chat says, yeah, don't ask, don't speak. You're not supposed to say anything. Wyatt says, I thought Biden was supposed to be was was supposed to be transparent with the public. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, it's the thing that all these presidents, you know, all these people, they run for office, right? Then they get in there and they realize there's this massive, entrenched, deep state of the United States government. Because here's the thing. Why would these deep state members of the military industrial complex give a rat's behind who is really in charge, right? They're there for like a few years and they're gone. But the military entrenched industrial complex, the intelligence community, the CIA, the FBI, all they're there permanently. It's permanent. It's permanent. It's a permanent state. And by the way, when President Trump started rattling the cages about bringing troops home from Afghanistan and other places, right, what happened? Suddenly there was all of these like voices from like the deep state within the federal government speaking out against Trump or they were driving this information about how cat catastrophic it would be for us to not continue these endless wars. 
right? And then Trump basically kind of pulled back on that and didn't really go along with it. He, he basically said, yeah, we'll, we'll pull the troops out of Afghanistan, but we'll basically increase our drone presence and, and other presence in the region. So you guys get what you want. But publicly, I get to look like a hero because I'm bringing people home. But now our efforts in Afghanistan and the Middle East and, 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 and Africa uh, are increasing. So, well, we're really not ending these wars at all. I mean, yeah, but, but Taiwan's going to be super, super important because we have to justify that $750 billion military budget. So we, yeah, need, we, well, need, we need and increasing it. And by the way, yeah. it's not even 750 anymore. It's 764. They just added that 30 billion on top of it. They'll probably add another 30 billion on top of it because now we need to be worried about China in, in Taiwan. Oh, yeah. It's never going to go down. It can only go up. No, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez last week introduced a bill that would slash the defense budget by 10%, and she was basically laughed at. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, not going to happen. But we got to, you know, by the way, we're sending all kinds of equipment there to Taiwan. We're sending all kinds of ti uh, to uh, uh, pieces of equipment there. So now I guess we're just repurposing stuff. We'll just start sending equipment there. We're going to start sending all kinds of Humvees and uh, all kinds of different craft, jets, and everything else we're going to be sending to Taiwan. So good. Which is interesting because I thought, I thought Taiwan was one of the most technologically advanced militaries uh, on the planet. I know that like uh, several years back they were. I don't know if they still are, but like just as far as like military technology. They well, were I mean, look, up. we've been propping them up for years. I mean, let's be honest, right? I mean, so the U.S. government has been doing this for a long time. This is not like... Yeah, we've been funneling the money in other ways clandestinely so that they can get this money. I mean, and the U.S. government has now approved an array of arms sales to Taiwan, including, I mean, Viper fighter jets, drones, ground launched harpoon and anti-missile ships. Army training teams will be there to help them learn how to use all of this stuff. All of the guns and howitzers that we also just gave them. Yeah, there you go. Get ready for the next war. <laughs> Uh, we knew this was coming. We've been predicting that here on the show for quite a long time. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I, I just don't understand how this is not more of a mainstream media story. Why are Americans so numb to this? And we just go along with it. Partially because they're just uninformed about it. Like if you're watching CNN, you're watching Fox, you're not, Fox, you're not going to see these stories. You're not going to see that story. We'll see. We'll see if anyone has the courage to cover this story big time in the mainstream media and ask questions about it. We'll see. And you know, if they do, they're, they're going to buy the whole, they're going to buy that whole mysterious object argument. You know, that's how, that's how they're going to do it. They'll, they'll make a fluff piece about a submarine hitting a, a, a mysterious object somewhere in the Pacific. They'll say in the Pacific. Yeah. It's just a random place. You know, it's just uh, it, it just hits a mysterious submerged object. We really don't know what it is in the South China Sea. It's you know, just something. You know, it's just ha but it's but the the you know the USS Connecticut is now stable and safe, and those eleven Navy uh, submariners are they, they were injured, but they're they're okay. It's a nuclear attack submarine. Do you mean to tell me? In the South China Sea, it just randomly hit an object. What was what what what, what was what was the object? A bouncy house? <laughs> what was the object? A big box of triscuits? <laughs> like what was this mysterious object that it just hits with all of the satellite and radar imagery and everything else we have got in these nuclear attack submarines in this region just randomly hits something? Right. Okay. Sure. Oh, man. Hey, we've got pet photos to get to today. But first, I want to tell you about our friends at Podium. That's right. Our friends at Podium are fantastic. If you own a business, okay, you know there aren't enough hours in a day to waste playing phone tag. I hate the phone tag game. The list of customers you need to reach doesn't get any shorter, especially when your business is doing well, right? That's why local businesses everywhere turn to Podium. And look at this, 60,000 businesses using Podium. Makes every interaction as easy as sending a text message. So everything that makes your business great can get done faster. Look, I have a dentist appointment this afternoon. Do you know how they confirmed my appointment and followed up with me? Text message. I don't need a phone call. Don't call me. It's going to go to voicemail. So that's how Podium works. Podium isn't just a better way to communicate. It's a better way to do everything. 
gathering reviews, collecting payments. So imagine we all communicate by text message. If a company you just bought a product from sends you a text message and says, hey, would you mind clicking this link and leaving us a quick review here on Google reviews or other place? Guess what? You're sitting there with your phone, you know, you're waiting in line somewhere at Starbucks or whatever. And you're like, yeah, I've got four minutes here. Well, I just got this text message. I'm going to do it. Like who's going to open an email or whatever and go to their desktop computer and leave a review? No, text message. It's how it does. It's how it's done. Podium makes it easy. Podium makes it really easy. Right, easy as pressing send. You won't just free up more time. You're going to grow your business and get more done. With Podium, you'll close deals with customers before the competition even has a chance to call them back. Join more than 100,000 businesses. Oh, it was 60 before on their website. Now it's up to 100,000 that are already using Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free, by the way. Go try it for free at podium.com slash invest or sign up for a paid Podium account and get a free credit card reader. They'll send a credit card reader to your house. So you don't have to pay for the credit card reader. Restrictions apply. That's podium.com slash invest. Try it today. Thanks so much, Podium. All right. It's pet photos time here at the Hacienda on this Friday. Maybe we can, uh, let's play, see if we can find some pet related music. What do you think? Pet related music. Let's see what, what we yeah, got. I'll let you pick while I get the pet photos up here. Let me see. Oh, and by the way, um, can you turn off? I'm asking you to do two things at once. Can you turn no off problem. members only and put it in subscriber only mode or subscriber mode? They have to be a subscriber for um for zero amounts of minutes. Okay. Yep. yep. Subscribers. And I love because I and I want to uh, welcome all of the new people. So if you're new here, all you need to do is just hit subscribe, and then you can start chatting with us. Okay. Um, uh, only channel members of five minutes or longer. Yeah, if you could turn it to zero minutes. Okay, hang on, let's see. And, and let I, me know uh, who is new. Just say, uh, say, let me know if you're new here and we'll welcome you. So everyone who's a member in green with a little Grover emoji, I want you to welcome all the new people. <laughs> Keith Johnson, welcome Keith. Latavia right Holm is new. Right off the bat with the devil faces, I love it. What is a devil face? I don't even know what that means. I don't even know no, how to find just, that. The it's the as an emoji that usually means uh, uh about to get up to no good. Like oh okay. Like like impish, if impish, you will. Impish, I see. Alexander says, We're free. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to all the newbies. Well, the reason we put on members only chat is number one, uh, because you know, we want to reckon we want to uh honor our members Num but number two is it makes the chat way more legible because i have it right in the middle of my screen so i read the chat the entire show and i interact and if the members only chat is not on it just flies by it's very very difficult to to, to read so uh we now we've got uh so hefner says i've been here a minute <laughs> Ho jose welcome. vargas is new welcome um Gordon says, I signed up for the newsletter yesterday. How do I find it? Uh, well, it probably was sent to your spam. Um, I would check your spam folder or your junk folder, Gordon, and then drag it over to your inbox. We, it should have been sent out this morning. So look for uh, look for the Morning Invest newsletter. Yeah, my, my first one. That's where my first one went. So I had to go in and, and OK. Yeah. That. If anyone signed up for our daily newsletter, which you can sign up by just going to morninginvest.com, morninginvest.com. It's the best newsletter on the planet. You can, by the way, unsubscribe to everything else out there. You can just subscribe to morninginvest.com. That's all you need to do. Um, we'll send you a welcome email. So it might go to your spam or your newsletter promotions, depending if you use Gmail or Yahoo, or it puts it in different places. So just drag it from that folder into your inbox. Um, and then you shouldn't have that problem anymore. Cindy Ogden says, I love your news channel. Thank you so much, Cindy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, we've got uh, we've got some viewer photos. Some good, we've got some good pet photos today. I'm gonna fly through these because we got a lot today, okay? I did see a photo with like a half naked man in here, so we'll get to that in a second. Just <laughs> cover your eyes. I think so. It was just like a flash. I'm like, is that a guy with no shirt on? Okay, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know names. There uh, better be a okay. pet in that photo, though. I think there is a pet in the photo. It's just not, okay. not just a naked person. Uh, Richard Blackstone, he's a mighty hunter, finds mice all the time. 
We don't Thank see you. the picture. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's Thank okay. you for that. There, that's what we're there looking for. There you go. Richard Blackstone, one of two cats from Richard Blackstone. Panther, the mighty hunter. His name is Panther? Oh, here's, oh, Richard Blackstone, Sophie. She's her teenage wonder cat. That's a cute kitty. I've never yeah, seen a color like that in a cat. Uh, this is the three, third of cats. Another, she's my old time baby. This is Missy. Thank you, Richard Blackstone. Richard, are you watching today? Hey, Tyler, I'm going to be cranking some of those up soon. Don't worry. Especially as I launch my Bitcoin mining operation. Chris Dominguez, how am I feeling? Oh, yes, I had COVID a few weeks ago and it was bad. I felt like I was going to die. I feel much better. Although my, my, sense, uh, my sense of smell and taste are still not fully back yet. Uh, Aloha from Winnie from K. Jole. Jole? Jole? Playing with the Roku, I see. Aloha from Winnie. Uh, let's see here. Apollo the Dachshund. 13-year-old Louie and the five-year-old Yorkie Poo from Deb from Michigan. Cute. Cute, cute, it. cute. Boo boo. Cat. Cat in a box. Cat in a box. How about this? Uh, what do you think about for music? Do you, maybe like, I don't know. I don't, I'm not usually a country music fan, but maybe like country. That might little twangy yeah, fun. Got, See if there's it looks like, like that. In there. It looks like everything they have on here is uh, basically the same. Because this, this we're going to listen to is lounge and it sounded just like a uh, chill hop. Let's do future pop and see what that's got going. <laughs> okay, feels then. like I'm walking into like Japan at Epcot Center. <laughs> yeah, like no matter what, we, we've got like our choice of elevator or. Yeah. Oh, this is from Roberta. This is Boo Boo from uh, Roberta. Thank you. A cat in a box. Cats love climbing up in boxes, man. Here, oh, right here, okay. Here's Carly from Florida, from Ross. There's Ross sent us in. Uh, Ross, I hope you're wearing pants uh, from Carly. Carly. Ross, are you watching? I hope you're watching. Dobby and, and a Grover mug. Love that. Oh, from Stevie, yeah. from Steve Watson. Is it Dobby or Dobby? Do Dobby, like, um,. He does look like Dobby from Harry Potter. Is, is Dobby uh, and his idol, Grover? I love that, his idol. Grover appreciates that. Grover is, uh, he's very appreciative to hear of that kind of love. It looks like a, it looks like a postcard. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? Grover's thank, thankful for the, all the attention. He's awake during the show. I know, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have here? We've got Fisher from Danielle. Marion from Danielle. Is that a happy birthday cookie? There's Fisher. Here is, uh, Get Her Done from Stephen Dunn. Is that the name of the dog, Get Her Done? Or is that just using your last name, Get Her Done? Sherry Dixon, I missed you. Says, Clay guess Clayton didn't miss me. Sherry, welcome. How have you been, Sherry? Hans Wolf says, I wonder if I can get some free box of gumdrops for being new. Well, we don't give away gumdrops. By the way, who would want gumdrops? But Hercules and Puta from Justin Hefner. Her I don't see the other one. Oh, but th thank you. There's a Grover mug laying on top of Hercules or, or uh, Puta. I don't know which one's which here. Oh, here's oh here's Hercules. Okay, Hercules is in the purse. <laughs> Cat purse. <laughs> and there's P Puta. Puta. Is Puta a bad name in Spanish, by the way? Yes. Okay. It Kobe. On how you say it. Right. Kobe is a dachshund. Uh, lab mix. A dachshund lab mix. I don't think I've ever seen a dachshund lab mix. Uh, it, it, are there, is, is Kobe's uh, legs a little short? From L. Pomps? What breed is Grover? Go Grover is uh, my, uh, my mini pincher. He's about one year old now. He's got the one floppy ear. He's a little mini pincher. That's about as big as he'll get. He's like a little potato. It's about the size. Uh, Lucy, two-year-old golden retriever from Cindy Cagle. That's a cute dog. Yeah. Here's Mako and Kona from Shannon Chambers. 
Mako and Kona. Do you live in Hawaii? That sounds like Hawaiian names. Mako is the one on top I can see from the collar. And Kona is the one who's being used as a pillow. Uh, oh my god. Oh, that's too Come much. Come on. Come on. This is that's Scooby. From Encinitas, California. This is David sent this one in. Scooby. Is that... Um, it's a new puppy. What would you say? Is that like a... a Oh, kind of looks like Grover when Grover was a puppy. Mini pincher. I, I can't tell what that is, though. Yeah, is that like a, that's a not lab? my... Lab baby? I don't know. That's definitely not my forte. There we go. Ooh, three cats. My dog and cats from Cheryl. Where's the dog? My dog and cats from Cheryl. Is it in the next photo, maybe? No, I don't see a dog there. Unless there's a dog buried under a cat. <laughs> Uh, here's my sister's new baby, uh, a Roddy French Mastiff. That's a beautiful dog from L. Pomps. Yeah. Look at those eyes. Yeah. My son's cat, Leon, a cat with an attitude. I can see he does look <laughs> like he has an attitude. Here's uh, Shirley Bland sent this one in. I like the collar. I like the uh, little handkerchief. I wonder if dogs like the handkerchief look. I know, that looked like that dog was wearing a dress. Here's Karen Wilson sent in Dora, sitting in the middle of the uh, a wreath, along with one of her twin tabby cats. I Thank think you, the Karen. other cat wants to be in the wreath. It's like, it's like, it's my turn now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pet Radio, female, five-year-old from Silky Renee Bush, Bush Harris, sent this one in. Pet from Betty Kirby. Is that a... What is that? That's a, a rabbit, right? Yeah, yeah. And Dwight Staggs sent in... Uh, looks like a Maine Coon and another type of cat. I don't have names from them. Rita and Miles are at an impasse from Tim and Linda McKinney. <laughs> Who's going to go through? Who's going to be the one that goes through this thing? They're going to meet in the middle. Uh -huh. <laughs> looks like somebody uh, opened a door in the... In the center of it too. Yeah. Oh, nice. I like that photo. Sasha and Allie from David in Minneapolis. Sasha and Allie. And show my cat is the headline from Chris Airwolf. Well, I showed your cat, but you didn't give me a name, Chris Airwolf. By the way, Airwolf, great 80s show. Airwolf. Is that your last name, Airwolf? That's a real last name. That's amazing, Chris. Squirty. <laughs> she passed on. She passed on the twentieth. Uh -huh. Aw, from Redmond, uh, from Redmond. Squirty. Well, rest in peace, Squirty. Sugar and uh, Tia snuggling from Belinda Edwards. Hey, Belinda. There you go, Belinda. Sugar and Taya, or is it Taya? T T A I A. Taya, Taya, Taya. This is G S P from Oliver. GSP from Wendy Lee Bercy. This is my GSP. GSP. I'm not sure what that is. All, oh, GSP. Some kind of dog. I don't know what, uh, but it's Oliver. Oliver, Oliver. Well, German Shepherd. Oh. Uh, German. I don't know what the P. Poodle? German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pomeranian? <laughs> no, there's, a, there's a glamour shot. This yep. is Stella. <laughs> this is Stella. Uh, I'm not sure. From B. I don't know who the rest of this is. B. About to, about to teach a course on 17th century poetry, French poetry, that dog was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where's my teacup? Thursday during the morning show with Sugar, Taos, and Seth from Belinda Edwards. Man, Belinda, you got a lot of animals. Beautiful Nothing living room there. That. You got a lot of animals. They're all taking up the couch. There's no place for you to sit, Belinda. And that's the last one for today. That's our last photo for today. All right, everyone. Well, much love to all of you. Thank you so much. My wife is yelling at me right now uh, because she scheduled a blood test for me. You know, I had COVID a few weeks ago, and uh, I hate needles. And so she's like, I scheduled a blood test for you. I want to see what your antibody count looks like. And I want to see it. I was like, oh, no, no, no. So she's texting me right now. She's like, you were supposed to finish the show 15 minutes ago. Go. You have a blood test appointment at the doctor's. Go now. But, but pet photos. But pet photos, honey. 
<laughs> Can I drag this out any further? She's yelling at me. Well, you know when she's yell she's yelling in all caps in text messages right now. All right, much love to all of you guys. Remember, Monday, we've got a huge announcement here on the show. Very, very excited about what we're going to be doing here on the show. So please subscribe. Set your bell notifications so you can join us on Monday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Um, we'll have stuff, content for you throughout the weekend as well. We've got some good stuff coming for you this weekend. But remember, Sunday, or sorry, Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern. We've got a whole big surprise for you. I'm really excited about that. All right, peace out, everyone. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday morning. 9 a.m. See you, Philip. Thanks, man. Yep. Thank you.